Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll-free. Toll-free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon and happy Tuesday, December 23rd. Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Season's Greetings, and Happy Festivus For the rest of us. (laughs) <laughs> Cannabis patients. <laughs> and to my left is Jennifer Solis, Kurt Dukach, Beach, and to my right is Perry, and behind the board we have Lawrence, who always makes us sound good. And we got a new addition to the studio this week. We got Rick working the camera. Hi, Rick. Welcome, Rick. Welcome. <laughs> okay, starting off, we have Jen starting with Desert Air. Oh, my goodness. They you had guys? their hearing after we went off of the air last week. They had their uh, chance again Wednesday. Well, who would have guessed that Desert Air would actually get approved? Raise your hand. I guess, you know what? I actually thought that they would get turned down, but Bob Coffin came in at the last minute and said, hey, you know what? This is my fault, folks, because I told these guys to drop their, uh, you know, to drop their uh, application here at the city. And then it came in that Desert Air, uh, what got 12th in th- of the state? Yeah, they ranked 12th by the state, and they were, uh, well, they never put an application in, so. (laughs) (laughs) They actually pulled their application after everybody went through the process and then resubmitted it because Councilman Bob Coffin thought that there would be opposition to the group. Well, and, and you know what? And he took the brunt of, of the the whole thing saying, you know what? This is totally my fault. I told these guys to withdraw, um, and so now I'm letting them resubmit. But... On the heels of that, GB Sciences filed a lawsuit seeking to block both Desert Air and um, what the other New one, Leaf. New, New Leaf, Leaf. and New Leaf, um, from reapplying to the city and getting city entitlements. Well, well, here's the difference with New Leaf. New Leaf is not reapplying. That's true. They are giving an opportunity to select another location within a five-mile radius of the one that they had applied in their application for. So they they applied, and they got denied because of a U-turn, and we we all kind of thought that was bogus at the time, Uh, and we we voiced it on the show, too. But uh, Desert Air completely withdrew their application before the hearing, and um, at Bob Coffin's, you know, suggestion. Right. And then they got to resubmit their application and they got approved, folks. He, yeah, he, like you said, he advised the group to table its dispensary proposal. And he even offered a mea culpa of sorts before joining four of his colleagues to approve the illegally submitted application. Councilman Kaufman, Kaufman is quoted as stating, quote, I suggested they withdraw. So I guess this is on me. I guess. Definitely fell on a sword there. Right? I didn't think they had neighborhood support. Little did I know that they not only have neighborhood support, they actually scored very high on the state's exam. That's why we are here. So you set out a process that everyone has to follow. You have these rules set in place. Yet you have, and this has, and Coffin represents the ward where Desert Air hopes hopes to open the door. So... There you have it. So, well, the the thing is, is that, and I even got said uh, later that it sounds like Jennifer's got sour grapes against these people. And, you know, on our website, it, well, that was one of the comments. And I thought, hmm, and I really examined, is it sour grapes against these people or is it just a complete lack of uh, the city following rules that's got me upset? And that's kind of what got me upset, actually, is because the city allowed them to withdraw. And that's fine. It, you know, you have the right to withdraw. But in allowing them to resubmit their application now after the deadline, that's kind of like bending the rules for people that, that 
you've wronged. And so Bob Coffin mm-hmm. thought he wronged these people, so he's like letting them, letting them come back and resubmit. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe that we can, you or any of us, have any ill feelings towards the girls at Desert Air or or their application. What we have a problem with is the the whole way they went about this. The city, the city. went about it, not, not Desert Air. The fact is that um, I believe these guys have a great application, and I believe they should have a dispensary. But I think since they withdrew their application that they should have to wait until next year, just like everyone else who didn't get, mm-hmm. their, app, get their licenses. I'll play devil's advocate here, I guess. Okay. Um, You're good at that. <laughs> Well, you know, Mr. Coffin, Councilman Coffin came out in public and he's just like, look, you know, this is my responsibility and this and that. And maybe this is an attempt for them to try to restore faith in government a little bit by them kind of openly coming out and saying, hey, you know, this is what we did. We screwed up and we're sorry. We want to make this public before we go ahead with this vote just for transparency's sake and things like that. So I can I kind of feel where people are coming from. They're like, oh, you know, you shouldn't. You know, hate on these people because they got a chance in this and that. But I understand like, you, you have to be able to look at both sides of the issue if you're going to argue the issue. So I definitely uh, see both sides of it. And at the end of the day, I'm kind of a capitalist, so I always want to see more shops open. And I think a lot, not only Desert Air and New Leaf, but many, many more shops that were qualified should have been granted, That's the truth. granted dispensaries. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I feel like uh, there was no time left to kind of address this issue on a state level because the legislative session is so close. Like I called, I was screaming for a, you know, special session a few months ago or a couple months ago, but it's just like, it's so close. We really kind of like got jammed up and there was just no chance to resolve this until we have a chance to resolve it, unfortunately. So, you know, they're just trying to deal with these things one, one day at a time. And really, like you said, we're still writing the rules on all this. So, well, these ladies paid, um, you know, a very high powered attorney to advise them. And then they then they go and they you know withdraw their application at a, a councilman's you know behalf. Now, had that ever come out before? Just the other day, had Councilman Coffin ever said before, "Look, I was the one who advised them before," or was that new and developing? Well, I I, I was surprised when he said it in chambers. So I, I just basically kind of caught it on fly. But I think um, when I had dinner with these ladies. One of them said that Councilman Coffin uh, had oh. urged them to withdraw. Okay, fair enough. This just kind of reminds me of my good friend Steve Sisolak. <laughs> Changing the rules as we go along. Well, you know, so that's what how happen- we do it. So what happens now? Does the lawsuit take precedent? Does the city's you know, authority take precedent? Are they ha- Do they have a license? Can they attempt to open shop right now well the lawsuit claims that the companies left key information out of their state application and that um it's still working its way through the courts we've kind of been looking at uh the dockets to see when it's going to be um you know to to see the date and and nobody's really seen hasn't been set date for the hearings has has not been set the date for the hearings has not been set that's the new leaf one and desert air yes all right well some more exciting news uh we have Hempy New Year. Hempy New Year <laughs> tickets. tickets to give away. All right. We have a pair of tickets. What caller, Jen? Oh, we're just going to take the first caller that um, hears the Spicoli like little blurb that says, sounds like this. I'm so wasted. <laughs> so you so call you... us at 702-731-1230 or 866-820-5528. Yes, and we have we have four pairs of tickets we're going to be giving away today throughout the show. So be sure to listen for that sound and be the first caller when you hear it. I'm so wasted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Movie. All right. So what else do we have in local news? We have the Dumbass of the Year Award. Oh, let's hear it, Raymond. Okay. There is a teacher, an elementary teacher, is arrested on drug charges for allegedly selling marijuana to her undercover officer. Wow. How much did she sell? It does not say. Laura Dromer, uh, she's a teacher at Rose Warren Elementary School. I guess that's where they have all the half ounces. (laughs) Oh, well, she sold a half ounce to an undercover officer. Yes, and she's released from custody on her own recognizance. And her preliminary hearing is scheduled for February 25th. So why is she a dumbass besides selling weed to an undercover cop? 
uh, because you're a teacher. It says nothing in here about her being a patient and you're being a drug dealer. You don't have a licensed dispensary. Need I go on? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> the, she broke the, the law. She broke the Period. law. Oh, just okay. Because she has a public job, she's drawn into the public spotlight. If she wasn't a teacher, she would just be some random person who got pop sell to a to a uh, undercover narc. But you know, which happens hey. all over the valley hey, daily. Hey, hey, yeah, I'm you're... a teacher. You don't see me slang, slanging dope to nobody. No sir. Well, yeah, so then, it just goes to show that one, you shouldn't break the law. Two, if you're in if you're in a position, you know, of authority or something, you know, in the public eye or educating children. You really shouldn't break the law. Thing, and, and you're an elementary school teacher. Look at the example that sets, you know, for the kids and those parents and everything else. Yeah, for I was, sure. I was reading a lot of the comments on the ReviewJournal.com about that. And a lot of the people were like, oh, you know, this is how they're, you know, spending their time and like give her a break and things like that. And it was just kind of funny to me to see the... Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't all of that. Of course, you had people like us talking. We're like, look, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, and it's ridiculous. But still, it's it's funny to me how the public tide is kind of turning on these on these subjects. It's just people don't really want to hear about it anymore. To tell you the truth, they want to hear about these are this is a low level cop, offense. They really. want to hear about cops busting bad guys. <laughs> yeah, and, and these are really low level offenses. A half an ounce. You know, that's it, that's kind of low level. That's an under a felony, isn't it? Yeah, it's not like she's slaying in pounds, but the point of the issue is, the point of the story is this. She's a you're, dumbass? You're a teacher, and you're, and you're slinging dope. You are not a licensed patient, and you don't have a dispensary. There you go. There you go. And nobody that's forced right. her to break the law. That's true. Speaking of break the law or not, um, Michelle Fiore. Michelle Fiore has been assigned... Re, you, know, you know rescinded then reassigned um she was removed from her assembly leadership position as the uh, it, the department of taxation and um and and she got removed not so much for her tax liens the one million dollars i would think i think she did it for bucking the system she's not a little good gop -er. You know, she basically, um, it says that she was faced with $1 million in tax liens and she waited until what Tuesday to last Tuesday to publicly address the issue. Um, then she went on a radio program, not here folks, but some other radio program and then blamed bookkeepers and former employees for tax troubles. Um, then John Hambrick reinstated Fiori as chairwoman of the taxation committee. But then he said again, um, a couple days ago that her leadership role had caused too many divisions among the Republicans. Um, she was not, she did not follow party line for the whole entire time that she was up in assembly. She kind of did her own thing, just like, uh, you know, the politician that she is. Now, what do you say? Does this really have to do with cannabis? Well, I would say it has uh, kind of ancillary effects on our cannabis world here because she was such a supporter of ours last session and anytime that we have a person in an authoritative position in a party that has been historically against our cause or at least recently against our cause as a lot of people perceive it uh, we like to have that kind of voice on that other side of the aisle so we like to say and definitely the more of authority she has the more authority she has to push bills through her committee and hopefully influence other influential possibly freshman republicans because she got so much done when she was a freshman republican you know she got nominated or not nominated she was named the uh like most conservative republican or most conservative uh legislator we had you know, during session regardless of the fact that she passed the cannabis bill and things like that so um, I'm, I was really hoping that as the chairman of the taxation committee and as the majority leader she would be able to kind of if someone wanted to kill the bill she might be able to use a little bit of flex to kind of use her sway to get that going and things like that uh, but it, it's just like you said, does it really have to do with her her tax liens? Well, you know, the IRS is very aggressive in their collection practices, and those could be late penalties. That could be this, that, or the other. And I'm not saying she doesn't have tax bills, but I'm saying... They could have been compounded. They could have been compounded. And I, I just don't know what the, the whole story is. And beyond that, um, like you said, she did kind of break ranks with the caucus not only on the cannabis issue but i would assume on a couple other things and they might be looking for someone who might uh be willing to play ball as they put it yeah, play, yeah follow the party be, line man it's just like uh, john ralston recently got a new job 
at uh, working at the Reno Gazette doing an article a couple days a week. And he's just like, oh, I'm glad I got a job right before the greatest legislative session ever gets underway. And because yeah, <laughs> and that's true, because, you know, there's just a lot of it seems like there's a lot of news coming up, coming out before things even get started. So, you know, we're going to see what happens and hopefully we'll be able to just constructively uh, push forward Nevada's agenda rather than just descending into bickering but well yeah, and the, the the point that we I, we were trying to kind of get around to and perry kind of touched on is that as the head of the department of taxation committee she's going to have a lot to do with the legalization bill that is going uh before the legislature this session now the head of the committee if you guys don't know this the head of any committee when they get a bill in front of them they can do something called tabling it Tabling it means that it goes into a drawer never to be seen again until they want to recall the bill. Uh, and that that is what, you know, is going to have such a big impact. Um, but marijuana is going to be taking the center stage during Nevada legislature this time. Uh, this session, based on Republican majority of both Assembly and the State Senate, it's very likely that voters are going to get a chance to vote on the question in 2016 about me recreational marijuana. Um, it's going, the passage of, mess, of recreational marijuana also needs two thirds of the votes. Since some taxation mechanism will most likely be attached, some lawmakers said that Nevada requires two thirds of a vote and all new taxes and tax increases. And so that actually is directly what Michelle would have to do with this. She was is the one that can either table that at the taxation committee or or push it through the committee. Oh yeah, she would have had definitely an influential voice and in her uh, friend Victoria Seaman, who was the vice chairwoman of that committee potentially was uh, my Re assembly woman. Removed for no reason. Now that one I can object to. Well, Victoria Seaman, I think it was her name that got her removed. <laughs> I, it was just her. It was just her attachment to Michelle. You know, she brought it, her it in. She, was. she went out. You know, with her. She did. Every time I things. saw them, every time I saw them, they were together like peas in a pod. You, you did hear that uh, ha Hambone or whatever his name <laughs> said that he found that Michelle's explanation of her IRS issues were unacceptable, uh, which was the reason that he pulled her again. Now. If you're having tax issues, I can understand being pulled from the tax committee, but I don't understand why they would pull her from majority leader. And I'm from an opposite party as she. So if she has earned the right to serve in that position, if she's basically paid her dues, you know, she should pay her taxes. But if she's paid her dues, you know, then, uh, yes, yeah, she should continue to be the majority leader. But if this is a legitimate issue that she hasn't resolved or addressed, you know, then me, me as a Nevadan, I don't want somebody that doesn't pay their taxes making tax law for me. Well, that's true. Um, there are also questions that are going to be raised in this legislative session about how Nevada is going to deal with the equivalent of DUIs or driving impairment. And we'll talk about that when we come back from a break. Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation, toll free, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. 
Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so wasted. All right, that sound indicates it's time for our 420 moment. And if you notice, Jeff Coley was in the background. It's time to call in for some Hemp Fest tick or no, Las- Hemp New, Hemp- Hemp- New Year tickets put on by Las Vegas Hemp Fest. So today, our 420 moment is Stephen Colbert. So, and the Colbert Report. The Colbert Report. Uh, Colbert was born in Washington, D.C. He's the youngest of 11 children in a Catholic family. He grew up on James Island in Charleston, South, uh, South Carolina. Uh, 2008 presidential bid, he announced his candidacy on his show and stating his intention to run both on the Republican and Democratic platforms, but only as as a favorite son in his native South Carolina. He later, later abandoned plans to run as a Republican due to the $35,000 fee to file for the South Carolina primary. However, he continued to seek a place on the Democratic ballot. Uh, and uh, he is presented with the key to the, uh, the city by Mayor Bob Cobo. So... Well, Stephen Colbert did his last rapport last week, um, and he opened up the op- opened up the show by saying, "Hey, if this is the first time that you've tuned into the rapport, I got some bad news for you." <laughs> um, it's the last. Some, yeah, it's the last. Um, some more notable quotes uh, that that uh, Stephen came up with while on the show: it, "Will stoners decide our next president?" And that was 2012. Uh, Stephen Colbert smokes out the logic on Florida's bong bill. And he, he quoted by saying, sorry, Sunshine State stoners, if you want to get high, you're going to have to get a prescription like everybody else. Uh, Stephen, the Colbert report speaks out on America's potastrophe. Um, and he, he went tug in cheek uh, to the heart of the fear of marijuana legalization. And he also poked fun at Idaho, saying that Washington and Colorado were going to use Idaho as a huge bong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had the graphic of Idaho like a bong on the, that show. Funny. That was a pretty good one. I remember a time when uh, he was interviewing Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin, and Robert Plant kind of just casually took out this thing that, of course, like I thought it was a joint. He passed it to him, and they were kind of joking back and forth, like, oh, we're going to smoke this after the show or something to that effect. And it was never really... Uh, like acknowledged officially either way but you know they, he's just always been a casual supporter of ours and uh he also had a few choice words for president obama on how he should uh, enjoy dc's new new cannabis law when you know the republicans had their uh their tidal wave in november and he was all kind of poking fun at obama a little bit telling him that he should fire up to relax and things like that and you know I, i've always kind of thought he was a passive uh supporter of ours and we'll kind of be sad to see his satire leave because i think he's going to do a more serious show for the late show i don't think he'll be bringing his character with him yeah so, so 2015 he's slated to take over for, for david, david letterman, letterman. Yeah, good for him yeah well it's just great for him yeah but it's it's still not the rapport i didn't see it hilarious. coming when he yeah, when he broke up. away from john stewart's show originally who thought that he'd be running the late show so you know here we are and we have a winner for the Hempy New Year tickets. We have Steven. Steven on the line. Congratulations. All right. Great. <laughs> right on, Steven. You won a pair of tickets for Hempy New Year. and That's at the Bar Bistro um, off of Charleston and Maine. And that should be a great party. Right yes. next to where we can usually has our uh, first Friday oh. booth, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's right across from I want from to the uh, make a possible addition for discussion on your show. Sure. Sure. What's up? Okay, I've been hearing a lot about uh, uh, Michelle Fiore. And yep. The, the guy that allegedly removed her. Yep, Hamburg. It sounds like he's not living up to his oath of office. I'm I'm 100% sure that Michelle Fiore has not been convicted of anything. That's true. Therefore, she is innocent until proven guilty. And for her to lose property because what this man thinks about the law that she allegedly violated... I think he should be recalled immediately. 
Uh, once again, this is an example of our state legislators enforcing federal policy. And uh, it's disappointing that in a state as independent as Nevada, we always kind of seem to do what we feel necessary when it's not when it's uh, convenient, politically convenient at the time. And you know, actually, actually, I saw the exact same thing happen last night at the town hall meeting that Commissioner Tom Collins had. Yeah, uh, what and, happened? And I, I like the fact that he had it. Well, he had uh, 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 the. Bundy. Yeah, uh, about the... Uh, Bundy. His, his son showed up. He wasn't able to be there. Uh, his, his son showed up and explained to him, look, these built people don't have any authority at all to be here, and we need them out of our state. We aren't interested in making a deal with them. You know, when... when There's a difference between... I grew up in Missouri before, I, uh, and I never heard this stuff from law, at law school, but... There's a difference between a creator and a creation. Uh, many years ago, our forefathers and foremothers uh, decided that they needed a federal government that they were willing to band together as state citizens. And somehow now the creation, the created... States, the United States. The, the created entity is now telling us what to do. And and Collins thinks that we should make a deal so we get something. You know, we don't owe him anything. He says we let's make a deal. If we if we nice? don't, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you there. If we don't owe him anything, then why should we kowtow to them? I I think I'm done. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Do we, and um, do we have your information? Get these tickets to you. Yeah, we need your information, Stephen. Off the air, you can uh, give Lawrence our information. Lawrence got it. Good. So awesome. Before the break, we were talking about some bills that are coming up in legislature and Michelle Fiore and all that. Um, do you know that uh, Tick Seeker Bloom is uh, uh, introducing a commercial hemp bill? Yay! That's about time. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, and he's introducing a bill in 2015 that would legalize the growing of hemp for commercial and agricultural uses. Hemp and marijuana come from the same plant. Uh, yet hemp only has trace amounts of the ingredient in marijuana that produces the high in people. So that's uh, that's another bill that I'm sure that we well, can and most of our supporters will get behind. Also in legislature, uh, the legislative session this time, there we're going to be talking about the equivalent of DUIs are driving impaired with cannabis. Uh, currently, it's one of the lowest in the nation at two nanograms per in uh, per mL. Uh, in your blood and you are impaired with cannabis. Now, most of us that are patients would wake up and have that much in our system. Um, yeah, it's de facto, uh, de facto intoxication. They think just because you have trace amounts of it in your blood that you're automatically intoxicated. And I think that's just crazy. You know, they should have to prove that you're intoxicated, similar to how all other medicines are being treated. Like, if the, if a police officer pulls you over and they find a bottle of Xanax in your car, they're not going to immediately take you to jail and then test your blood and then let the courts work out whether you're you're under the influence or not. You'd have people going to jail all the time. This is uh, true. Which, well, we already do, but even more than we already do. But... Uh, uh, what they do is I think they would just kind of take you out and give you a field sobriety test. And if you pass, they let you go on your merry way. And if you're too intoxicated to pass the standard field sobriety test as the officer feels fit, then off to jail you go. And then they go through the process. And I kind of like it. I would like it to be that way for, for medical marijuana also. I mean, they you know, should if, if it's medicine, it should be treated like medicine, not be treated like a criminal and then prove that it's medicine, even though you've already proven that it's med medicine by getting your card to prove that it's medicine. So... They should have to right. prove impairment. They shouldn't have to improve impairment, not a number in your blood for sure. We'll see how that goes, though. You know, we might get a little a little resistance, but I'm hoping that uh, logic wins the day. So, An another uh, issue that's up in our legislative session this time is the employment predicament and drug mm -hmm. testing. If you go in a drug test for your job and you have your medical marijuana card, you should show your card. You get drug tested. And if you're under the impairment limit, there should be no issue whatsoever. But some people feel that jobs like construction jobs, driving jobs, uh, jobs that have public safety in mind really don't need to follow those rules. That it'd be any impairment. Like, you know, if any Xanax is in your blood, if any cannabis is in your well, blood, if any okay, cocaine so is in your blood. So basically then 
people can have no medicine to treat no illnesses so we can only have perfectly healthy and perfectly fit perfect people do these certain jobs is what they're saying because only people with absolutely nothing you know only what mormons who can't have any caffeine or anything like that only you know perfectly moral people can have these jobs apparently which i don't really see as necessary either i don't want to put it this way but you know i had a uh, a job doing rigging for you know seven or eight years made my living hanging thousands of pounds of heavy stuff over people's heads with a lot of people who i worked with we never dropped anything we never do drop anything and we all enjoy ourselves on a casu safety ca casually after work yeah. and it's just you know in the way that we enjoy it. and it's just kind of disappointing that people want to put everyone in a little box and try to you know put the clamps down and employers rights have gotten completely out of control in this country and uh, i'm really excited to take that to task eventually and see where this argument goes because no one should be denied from being gainfully employed for taking their medicine especially but for doing what they want to do with you know by themselves in the privacy of their own homes on their time off yeah no. on their time off if you want to pay me 24 hours a day you can control my life 24 hours a day but until that comes you know it's hard for me to take that seriously and and uh and submit to that so willingly yeah, for sure. Do we have anything else from legislature, Kurt? Uh, we got one more bill. Senator Debbie Smith, a Democrat from Sparks, is proposing laws that would tax and regulate where people could use e-cigarettes, called, commonly called vaping. Mm -hmm. Now, this not necessarily is cannabis related, but a lot could of those, a lot of those <laughs> right. vape pens and people where you buy the stores, are, uh, she's imposing a tax not only on the e-juice, but on the on the pens and that themselves. So it does kind of uh, affect us a little bit. I can see where they're going with that because you know tobacco companies pay pretty heavy taxes to sell their products and these are tobacco replacement products smoked by people who commonly use tobacco or would use tobacco in their place so why not try to exercise a tax against that also you know, like, I, I understand where she's coming from I mean of course it's just more government taxing more uh, more of our lives but you know, I, I, I can see the idea yeah so this legislative session has got a lot of a lot of news for us uh, news for us do you have something else for us perry down there well this is out of california it's kind of back to cannabis but uh well it's a kind of an issue that i've been worried about for a while and i'm kind of glad that the california courts have taken it up it's all about dabs and the title of the article is dabs win california court rules cannabis concentrates as medicinal now i have been worried for a long time that once the courts or the local legislative bodies got a hold of this issue that they would be like oh dabs have no medicinal value and we need to illegalize this and there's no purpose for it but these appellate courts in california didn't see it that way there was this case of this 22 year old kid who got pulled over and he had a medical license and he had a little bit of flowers but he also had a half a gram of this wax and the police officer rather than let it slide he's just like well you know we're going to take you to jail and let the courts figure it out so they fought it and fought it and it went to all the way to this appellate court and they said look you know he bought it from a licensed dispensary and we're going to we're going to err on you know the side of the uh the not patient. the science but the patient yeah and the way they interpreted the law was that these cannabis concentrates are protected under these uh under these laws also so that was really really great and it doesn't mean anything for any other states but it no. hopefully might set a precedent for other potential case law that might come up in other states and so, what's hilarious is that we don't have those same laws our concentrates weigh the same as flowers so right, you right. could you could have you could have like a whole gob of dab and and <laughs> yes, still be, can. and and still be under your weight limit for the state of nevada and we don't want them to recognize anything i mean like keef and all that stuff like that the cops barely know what that is here for heaven's sake um, I've I've been post raid into people's houses where they for, they've forgotten or just overlooked like a ton of like pollen and all oh, sorts yeah. of stuff because they have no idea what it is. A friend of mine had a dispensary in Venice that was raided, and uh, the cops took you know like all the pounds of weed and broke into the safes and all kinds of stuff and left and he's like they just left like tupperwares full of wax because they just didn't know what it was they're like what is this just like dumped it all over the floor you know and you're like were, picking they, hairs off well, of it <laughs> and they they were open for business like they reopened the hash bar like two hours later they're like oh we're ready to roll you know everyone open the doors back up and just sweep up the glass but uh you know that's that they are getting a little more hip now for sure yeah. but uh, i got a little bit more news out of oregon sure um well Actually, I think someone else has the first. Uh, Actually, I think story. that will California sue or will Nevada sue Oregon next? Yeah. This is crazy, folks. Anybody that's been uh, following this, Nebraska and Oklahoma have 
challenged neighboring Colorado's recreational marijuana laws by suing them. They're saying that the pot is seeping across their borders, and then Colorado is vowing to defend their laws. Well, you guys have to re- uh, recognize that we are on the border of Oregon. A 200 mile long shared border, I believe. Yeah, 200 miles long. And so, are we going to see Oregon next with their weed sleeping over here? Um, well, actually, we won't be next because Kansas actually filed suit on December 22nd <laughs> against Colorado, oh, also. My God. So now there's three states on board. Oh my goodness, and and they're seeing that the the Colorado is leaving this dangerous gap for illegal or federal drug control system because marijuana is going to flow through the border, well, um, which I'm sure it is. Yeah, and it's it's draining their treasuries because they have to deal with the scourge of the problem, and it's not like the problem has never been there. Yeah, that's a bunch of BS. They already had you know officers allocated. They're just attempting to make you know a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah, much to say. do of nothing. Much to do about nothing, really. Um, and and so. That's what I'm asking. Are we going to sue Oregon next? I don't want to because I like Oregon. <laughs> no, we're not going to because we have a recreational bill coming through our legislature the next year. I don't think that Kansas or you know Oklahoma or Nebraska or anywhere like that is even looking at medical bills right now. I'm sure they're kind of you know on the opposite side of that. But also there's kind of a sto- side of the story that's not being told. Uh, the anti-cannabis legalization group's smart approaches to marijuana is backing this legal action. Oh. And Kevin Sabat, the co-founder of the group, says that while states should be able to decide appropriate sentencing and criminal sanctions, uniform federal drug laws are vital. So basically, he's his lobbying group, having lost the ballot initiatives, are now trying to circumvent the will of the people by... Uh, giving the money straight to the attorney generals or whoever is doing this in this in these respective states and uh, trying to get them just to sue it that way and enforce federal law, basically getting the states to do the government's job for them so, with private money. So sour grapes. Which, yeah, that's total. I just think that's awful. You know, I mean, it really is just we, circumvents the will of the people. It, it's, it spits in the face of the democratic process as we have established it. You know, the people of Colorado and Washington and other states have voted that this is what they want. You know, prohibition. I mean, we've been doing prohibition their way for 90 years. And it's not so, working. Well, you know, all, is it do, all, all it's doing is it's jailing people that otherwise would not be in jail. You know, cannabis doesn't hurt anybody until they get arrested. That's right. Yeah, the mo- I saw a little internet meme that said the most dangerous part of cannabis is getting caught with it. And there's a little bit of truth to that for sure. No doubt about it. All right. What do we have next? Do we have anything next? I'm so wasted. <laughs> <laughs> Time for more tickets to be given away. That means it's uh, first caller to call in at our lovely radio station here. It's a free pair of tickets to Happy New Year presented by Las Vegas and Reno Hemp Fest. That's right. Uh, the Reno Hemp Fest is coming in June, and then our next Hemp Fest is going to be in October. October but, 2nd. October 2nd. But if you guys want to experience the Hemp Fest experience, Hempy New Year is going to be at the Bar Bistro. So give us a call to, where, to win those tickets now. Well, there's also a little bit of a, a little bit of news coming out of Alaska. Always news coming out of Alaska recently. Every single, every single week there's new news. Uh, there is a new assembly committee in Anchorage that's going to look at r- legal marijuana sales. The Anchorage Assembly has formed a committee whose sole focus is to consider the implementation of marijuana sales. Assembly, assembly Chair Dick Triani announced Friday that the committee is going to look at regulation and taxation of the cultivation, manufacture, and potential commercial sale of marijuana in Anchorage. Assemblyman Ernie Hall will chair the committee, which also includes Assembly Members Pete Peterson, Amy, Dimba- Amy Dimbowski, and Paul Honeman. Amy Dimbowski is the woman who proposed the ban on uh, all marijuana retail sales in Anchorage before the bill came to uh, came to fruition, not came to fruition, but was implemented because there's like a 90 day cooling off period between the time when they count the votes and when it actually becomes law. Mm -hmm. And that actually hasn't happened yet. It happened sometime in early February. So before that bill even took effect, she wanted to ban it. And now she's on the committee to kind of take a look at it. And, you know, I'm fine with that. You always have to have both voices. But uh, the proposal that she put forth even though it was co-sponsored 
even though it was co-sponsored by uh, two other members, was ultimately voted down nine to two. They didn't even get the three votes out of the the co-sponsors, so they just wanted, you know, it's like I was telling some of the people up there. I think they just want to have their have you kind of kiss their ring. You know, I think the local city councils up there have been kind of left behind with the state, uh, all the attention to Alaska state state politics. So hopefully we can we can get this all going. And uh, I think uh, my. Uh, producer here is telling me that it's time for a break so we're going to go to our second break and hopefully come back with some hemp fest tickets right on you're listening to the nevada cannabis news hour produced by we can the wellness education cannabis advocates of nevada we can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702-218-5226 or Kurt, K-U-R-T, at WeCan702.org. Greenspot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. The Von Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Hi, welcome back to the show. This is Nevada Cannabis News. Uh, we w- Before we went on break, we were kind of talking about some Alaska stories and what's going on up in Alaska. And next we'll move on to Arizona. This is kind of a follow-up story about Sue Sicily. If you guys will recall, she was the um, she was the teacher in Arizona. She was a professor in Arizona, a doctor, uh, that got money to do a... Uh, a, a study for PTSD with veterans with cannabis. Yeah, I remember that. She was the one who got gifted that big grant that was in the news so much. Well, guess what? Now the the Colorado has awarded more than $8 million for medical marijuana oh, research wow. on Wednesday, last Wednesday, um, to her. The grants awarded by Colorado Board of Health are going to go to studies on whether marijuana helps treat epilepsy, brain tumors, Parkinson's disease, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of the studies are still going to need federal approval. Although the awards are relatively small, they represent a new frontier for medical marijuana research. Yay, yay. Um, because the grants in Colorado are going to be spent to explore the drug's medical marijuana potential and not the health downsides of marijuana, um, they represent some of the first awards that the federal government are going to acknowledge outside their own realm of, of studies. Um, three of the eight research products uh, projects inc- include a veteran study, and they still need they still need federal clearance for this from um, the from the federal government. There are also five observational studies. That means you bring your own weed. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask you. I wonder, since the studies have to be like approved by the government, are they going to then request? cannabis from that farm in Mississippi or since it's taking place in Colorado, they'll probably be using Colorado cannabis, I would assume. Well, three of the eight, of the eight research projects um, are going to need access to that old Miss Marijuana that you were okay. speaking of, but five studies that are observational studies uh, mean that the subjects are going to have to bring their own cannabis. <laughs> Uh, so the projects posed for approval last Wednesday and, and got approval were two separate studies using marijuana to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. $3.1 million is allocated for that. Whether adolescents and young adults with irritable bowel syndrome benefit from marijuana, $1.2 million is going toward that. Using marijuana to relieve pain in children with brain tumors, $1 million is going toward that. 
how oil derived from marijuana plants affect pediatric epilepsy patients. Over $500,000 is going towards that. Comparing marijuana to oxycodone for pain relief, about a half a million dollars is going toward that. I can tell you right now that cannabis is, is better than oxycodone. I can tell like, you too. I've been on both. Those all sound like really, really good studies. So the money is coming from Colorado's medical marijuana patient fees and not Colorado's new taxes on the recreational pot. Um, so this is a groundbreaking study. The VA is not going to be participating directly in these marijuana studies. And, um, the money is going to be coming from the 117,000 medical marijuana patients who pay $15 a year to be on the registry. I just paid my $75 fee today. <laughs> uh, I've got my $75 fee coming up really, really, really mm -hmm. soon. I'm so wasted. <laughs> uh, that means it's time to call in for Hemp Fest tickets. This call is in our number last one, pair of 702 731 1230. This is our last pair of Hemp Fest tickets. Or, I mean, and our Hemp New Year, Hempy Sorry, New Year no, tickets. We keep that. It is Hempy New Year. Hempy New Year tickets. So, um, I got a follow up story on the, the remember the pot auction that uh, the guy did up in Washington where he sold all of his pot and he wanted to donate a portion of his proceeds yeah he sold it like for four bucks a gram i was out i was like what yeah he had fourteen thousand uh, dollars that he initially hoped to donate to the the school system but the superintendent rejected the offer saying it sent the wrong message about marijuana mm -hmm. then he tried to give it to the local boys and girls clubs but they also turned him down <laughs> you said, know what well, we we came we came up against this in our first year of operating we we, we collected canned goods um and we were going to give them to different locations here in the valley, and they said that they would take the donation, but they wouldn't take it under our name. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, we'll take your money. We just don't want to officially say who it's coming from. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. Well, no thanks. So the same thing's happening here, huh? Yeah, he's finally managed to find a cause. Uh, it's a needy family willing to take his cash. <laughs> Oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> I'll sign up for that one. So he actually ended up donating $1,000 to the local VFW and $13,000 to a local family there in need. That's not, that's good that he finally was uh, <laughs> finally able, able to give, to away give his, money. his money away. <laughs> yeah, no good deed goes unpunished, I guess, sometimes. Hmm. That's just crazy. That's just crazy. Raymond, you got anything for us? Congress passes historical medical marijuana amendment as part of federal spending bill. In the over 1,600 page uh, federal budget, um, it marked the first time in history that Congress has approved legislation rolling back the federal government's war on medicinal marijuana patients and providers. The bill includes an amendment that prohibits the Department of Justice from using funds to interfere with state medical marijuana laws. The federal spending bill also prohibits the U.S. Department of Justice from interfering with state level hemp laws. But unfortunately, the bill also contains a provision that is meant to usurp and interfere with the implementation of D.C.'s recently approved marijuana initiative and effectively blocks the district from regulating marijuana. Even though they approved it by what, like 70 percent? I think like it was sixty-two percent. But regardless, if it, they won by six percent or six hundred percent, it's the will of the people that's being usurped. Absolutely, no doubt about it. One step forward and one step back. It seems like. All right. Do we have anything uh, else? We have cannabis travel. All right. So um, there's a best-selling author and television personality, Rick Stevens. He's going to discuss strategies uh, strat strategies that are legalizing marijuana in the United States. And he is going to appear at the first International Cannabis Business Conference in San Francisco, February 15th through 17th. He's the host of a public radio uh, program. And he's um, one of the most mainstream advocates for cannabis law reform. Uh, traveling the world sent him on his path to advocacy, he said. He co-sponsored the New Approach Washington in 2012 initial, uh, initiative to legalize, tax, and regulate marijuana in Washington State and toured Oregon this year speaking in favor of the state's ultimately successful tax and regulate effort. Um, he is talking about emerging businesses in the cannabis business conference and one of those emerging businesses is cannabis travel uh, 
you know, many people travel with their cannabis. <laughs> I would totally buy his book if he wrote a cannabis travel book, by the way, just as a disclaimer. I've, I've read a couple of his books, kind of like admittedly cheesy so, but I mean, his books are decent if you're a traveler. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always been kind of hesitant to travel to certain places like, oh, you know, um, you know Texas. how are the laws there? Yeah, well, I went to go see an F1 race in Texas a couple years ago, and I was a little freaked out. You know, I had to take my medicine with me on the plane. It wasn't enjoyable. I would much rather go somewhere to where I know that uh, I'd be have an adequate supply. I can just get it, you know, more easily. And that's why with the expansion of recreational marijuana, and not only that, but there are a lot of other places that are kind of working on that. Like uh, I think Guam got medical marijuana legalized recently, and just like a lot of other places are kind of starting to buck that trend. So uh, yeah. it's the the world is becoming more travel friendly to me, <laughs> slowly, or at least America is. Virgin Islands also recently decriminalized. I forgot about that. That's right. Yeah, um, I think it was this past week that they went ahead and did that. The um, Senate, I believe, the uh, state lawmakers voted, Senate lawmakers voted to override Governor DeJong's, DeJong's, I don't know how you say it, line item veto of the decriminalization provision, which had been included in the territory's 2015 fiscal budget. Uh, it eliminates jail time for minor marijuana offenses under the law. Cannabis possession for those under 18 and older is classified as a civil offense, punishable by between $100-$200. That's great news. That That's is fantastic. great news. So they're not looking to like tax, regulate, get dispensaries or anything like that. They just want to decriminalize it to just kind of take the, take the penalties away. Yeah, they want to decriminalize possession of one ounce or less. Okay. Well, that's enough to go on vacation with. No, no doubt about it. That's uh, That makes me very, very happy. Yeah. Speaking of vacation and uh, the cannabis travel, there's uh, just uh, a Grateful Dead-themed Bud and Breakfast just opened in Colorado. That's pretty cool. Oh, Kurt. <laughs> Is that where we're going? Yeah. The Grateful Dead-themed Bud and Breakfast Silverthorn has officially opened its doors to mountain tourists. The Mary Jane Co Group property re uh, represents the company's second foray into Bud and Breakfast, as the company also owns the uh, Adego in Denver, Colorado. It's the first ever Bud and Breakfast. While the theme may be hippie, the guests won't be a bunch of stoners looking for a crash pad. Prices in the room of uh, <laughs> the rooms range from 149 to 199, but the Cush Garcia Suite is the coup de gras. <laughs> <laughs> Did it say if it comes with, uh, like, you know, free joints on your pillow, like a chocolate or something like that? Well, free cannabis chocolates on your pillow? Actually, unlike many, many weed-friendly hotels in Colorado, this one actually strives to educate and medicate its guests. Marijuana comes paired with hors d'oeuvres from a local gourmet chef. Good grub is the staple of any hangout, weed or not. And the product samplings are led by the on-site innkeepers Mark Rosenthal and Stephanie Kohnler. The two explain the difference between sativa and indica, recommend edibles for a post-ski nap, and if guests want to just lounge and chat, roll joints for everyone to share while playing uh, Yorkie Mix Crash, uh, that's fine with them too. So, Right on, right on. So I know where we're going uh, next year after you know, this legislative <laughs> session, huh? You know where you shouldn't go? Where shouldn't we go? Richmond. Richmond, Virginia? Yes. Why not? Because police officer Jose, Joe Avila pulled a fast one when he confiscated and then kept a box filled with five pounds of marijuana. Did he get arrested? Hell to no. What? Did he get any disciplinary action whatsoever? Hi, <laughs> you got jokes. Paid vacation, perhaps? Come on, it's not like he uh, killed someone. Did he get kicked off the police force? <laughs> ah, keep trying. <laughs> Avila confiscated the weed, told the dispatcher he would be bringing the evidence into Richmond's locker. But instead, he brought the pack home and he kept the lush nugs for himself. He couldn't even bring in a zip oh, to turn that's, that's par for the course. Well, we're running out of time, so let's talk about our uh, holiday party. Announcements. A holiday party on Saturday. The Saturday. 6490 West Desert Inn Road. It's at the corner of uh, DI and Torrey Pines. I believe that's the, what, southeast Northeast corner? corner. Northeast and, corner. Thank yes, you. And this is a fundraiser, so it is $10 to get in, but all the money goes to support a patient who can't afford their card. And please park on Torrey Pines. It's from 1 to 6 p.m., and we will be having dinner uh, after Christmas uh, weekend style, we're going to provide the ham and the rest of the dinner will be potluck style. So bring your favorite dish and enjoy the day with us.
And also, we're going to be hosting our third job expo Sunday on January 25th at 1.30 to 5. And I guess we'll see you guys next week. And thank you so much for tuning in. And thanks for our newsletter. Text WEEKEND at 22828. Be safe out there. Merry Christmas.